The snow depth at Snoqualmie Pass keeps increasing. We're now at almost two meters, almost to the point where WashDOT needs to consider avalanche control at a few locations above I-90. Across the road from where Seattle learned to ski is where WashDOT learns to see. Signs the snowpack at Snoqualmie Pass could weaken, releasing an avalanche onto I-90. We have three main avalanche areas west of Snoqualmie Pass, one on Denny Mountain, one on Granite Mountain, okay. and the other that is just over the hill there from, from the Summit West ski area. We call the shed wall and airplane curve. Accessing these three problem spots to investigate the avalanche risk is too difficult or dangerous on a daily basis. But on this nearby flat sheltered site, it's convenient to pierce. There's an ice layer there. Dig deep into. That sugary appearance, we don't want that. And weigh. The amount of, uh, of water that's in there. There's three things we look at. Okay. One is the, is the layering, the okay. stratigraphy of the snow. Will it, will it release? Okay. And then the second one is how, how big of an avalanche we might have. Will that avalanche reach the road? Okay. And then is there anything in the weather that's going to change that? Okay. Is it going to make it more unstable or, or, or less unstable? Digging in the snowpack exposes different layers from past weather events. So this is our old snow. They may be rains that formed a crust on a previous snow surface, or partially melted or frozen crusts recently buried by newer snowfalls. That's all the old snow yeah. from early January. These layers often extend from the snowpack here into the steep slopes of the problem areas and may provide a weak failure plane over which snow could suddenly destabilize and quickly slide down over. It often happens after a quick change in the weather, like a quick heavy snow or rain. Rain here, especially at Snoqualmie Pass, it's both the enemy and that it creates avalanches, but it quickly leads to more stable conditions for us. And, and it gets rid of these, this sugary snow. <laughs> a rainfall soaking in may add a lot of weight to the snowpack, dramatically increasing the load, forcing it downward. But if the slope sustains the rain, it may eventually seep into the weaker sugary snow layers, strengthening them. We call it a temperature profiler. New research here analyzes how the temperatures vary as much as five degrees from the top to the bottom of the snowpack, meaning sub-freezing temperatures below the snow may transition to above freezing temperatures at the surface of the snowpack. Then, on cold, dry nights, quickly dropping temperatures, as measured by infrared thermometers, can result in a frosty surface crust forming, another potential weak point. Snow responds to changes, uh -huh. slow changes very well, but rapid changes, it, it falls apart. I see. Weak planes in the snowpack here are often also represented in the snowpack in the avalanche zones, as is the total snow load. Back in the winter of 1998-99, there was so much snow, it came to the top of this 15-foot tower. This is where a windshield protects the precipitation gauge for accurate measurements. Predicting the size of a possible avalanche can determine if it would run onto the roadway or stop short. In the next couple of weeks, our likelihood of doing avalanche control increases, okay. particularly with new snow. That control, temporarily shutting down I-90 to detonate explosives to trigger the avalanche on our schedule, not Mother Nature's. Although the seasonal schedule is often a big driver, as higher snow depths usually build through the beginning of spring. That means more snow with a heavier weight, increasing the force directing snow down the slopes in March and April. Beginning of March is our average annual peak snowpack. So we're, we're just getting towards that, that high point of the year. Snow reports have been taken at this site since the 1930s, with intensive investigation into physical properties since the 70s. If we weren't here to do our job, avalanches could hit the road in those areas. Hold on, I'm coming. John, here we are in the winter wonderland. You're an avalanche specialist, right? I am. Okay, we're at Snoqualmie Pass. Right over there, you can see the summit, right? All the snowboarders and skiers, it looks like fun. 
But for skiers that go off piste off the trail, there's a hidden danger, right? There is. Okay. Yeah. And the hidden danger is actually in these trees. I see a lot of snow collects on the trees, and that means that you get voids underneath. You do, yeah. We see these this really large tree well over here. Uh -huh. That's not where we're worried about. Okay. We're concerned with these these real small ones and this this tree, if I get up close to it, you can see I start to sink in there and okay. like my foot isn't even touching the the ground there. Okay. If you fall in there head first, uh, you're stuck. Okay. And you this need is, a partner. This is a tree well. A tree well, yeah. Okay. And people can fall in when they're skiing and then you're stuck. Uh, what do you do to avoid yeah. this? The first thing you, first thing and most important thing is ski with a partner. Okay. Someone needs to help you get out. Okay. If you fall into a tree well, particularly head first, don't panic. If you start panicking and grabbing, you're going to shake all the snow off. It's going to uh, fall onto you. Okay. You're also going to wiggle down deeper. It's going to make it even harder to get out of there, and you're going to have less airspace. Okay. So you have to remain calm. And I, if I fell in there, I need to rely on you to get me out. There's nothing I can do once I'm down there to get out myself. Very little you can do once you're in there, other than to have somebody else help you. Okay. So always go into the backcountry or uh, when you're skiing off the trails with a partner. If you're skiing, particularly in the trees, have a partner. When you think of avalanches and avalanche danger, a lot of times, Jonathan, you think of a big avalanche coming down a mountain, right? Right. And that is a danger for the backcountry of Washington state, but there's also another, uh, I guess, type of avalanche that's a concern. Right, and that's a, a roof avalanche. You really need to be careful around around metal roofs and with lots of snow on them. Okay, so when the snow comes off of a roof, that is an avalanche it, also? It is an avalanche, yep. Okay, and then so you see all that snow, it's actually precariously perched up there. And so I guess if we get melting or a lot of rain, all of that could come down. It does, yeah. Okay, would that happen when you have drastic weather changes one way or another? We would most likely see that when it rains. When it rains. What could make a roof avalanche even worse is a terrain trap. Yes. In other words, there's nowhere for me to go once the snow comes down on me. Right, and it's the same same in the backcountry. A small slope may have a, a creek or something at the bottom and you're trapped in there. Okay, so yeah. if you're in a little narrow canyon, yeah. And you can't run. There's no place to go. Right. You're stuck with the snow. A little gully or something like that. It may not seem like a very big slope and, and not that menacing, but you have to look at what the, where the run out is. And that and could be... when it comes down to it, you could be trapped in an area you could with be snow trapped. falling on you. And there have been fatalities, actually, from this type of snow falling on people. There have, yeah. Yes, okay. unfortunately. Unfortunately. All right. So always be aware of your surroundings. And when you're out in nature, always look up, right? Yep. Look up, <laughs> look, up look down, look all around. All right. Make sure you know what's above you, anything that could slide your direction. Yes.